Hello and welcome to this video on mean structures in CFA and SEM. My name is Christian Geiser, I'm an instructor with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. I usually talk about multivariate statistical methods including factor analysis, structural equation modeling, multi-level analysis and latent class modeling. If this is something that interests you, then please subscribe to this channel. Also, check out the description for additional resources, including workshops that I offer through Quantfish. In this video, I want to address a topic that is confusing to many people who work with factor analysis and structural equation modeling. And that is the question of whether and when to include a mean structure in your analysis. Oftentimes, and also historically, we think of confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling as covariant structure models. And some people will even use that term interchangeably with structural equation modeling, implying that the main focus of these types of models is on modeling observed variances and covariances. In other words, the covariance matrix of a set of observed variables is used as input and then the variances and covariances that we observed are explained by one or more latent factors or latent variables. However, it is also possible to include mean structures in CFA and SEM. And in this video, I want to address the questions of when would you do this, why would you do this, and how would you do this by showing you an example. So why would you include a mean structure in your analysis in addition to a covariance structure where you simply model the variances and covariances. And so the first example where this is relevant is when you have a longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis model or any kind of longitudinal structural equation or factor model. So this also applies to growth curve models, latent change score models that I will show you later, potentially to autoregressive models, latent state trait models, all those types of longitudinal CFAs for which, by the way, you find a lot of videos on this channel if you're more interested in those different types of models and how they are analyzed. Then I have a bunch of other videos and also a playlist on those types of models. So when you have longitudinal data, meaning repeated measures data, why is the mean structure relevant in addition to the covariance structure? Or maybe even why is it the primary source of interest when you have longitudinal data? And there are essentially two reasons for that. The most important reason probably is that you would want to compare means across time. So here in this model where we have two time points and a factor with two indicators, at each time point, we might potentially be interested in finding out whether the means changed from F1 or time one to time two. So we would want to conduct latent mean comparisons. And then related to that, we would also want to know whether there is measurement invariance or measurement equivalence across time in the measurement of these two factors. In other words, are we able to meaningfully compare those factors in terms of their mean structure and variances and other um, parameters? That so to say depends on whether we have measurement equivalence, meaning whether the measurement models have the same factor loadings and the same intercepts or additive constants. And I'll talk more about this more technically or in a little bit more detail later on. So those two things here are relevant is measurement invariance across time. That depends on the mean structure because the intercepts are related to the mean structure and then also the latent means that we want to compare. And so then it definitely makes sense to include a mean structure when you have a longitudinal CFA. Another example of a longitudinal CFA is a latent difference or latent change score model, which here actually is an equivalent model to the longitudinal CFA on the left hand side, meaning it would imply the same covariance and mean structure as the longitudinal CFA on the left hand side. But in the model on the right, you're able to not only model the mean of the factor at time one, but you're also able to model the, diff, the mean of the difference factor. So the difference score variable here on the right hand side reflects the latent or true score difference from 
or between time two and time one. And so we can estimate the mean of the different score variable as a parameter in the model. And then that estimated mean will give us an estimate of the latent mean difference between time two and time one. A similar thing happens when you specify a growth curve model where you estimate the intercept factor mean, so the time one mean, and the slope factor mean for, for example, a linear slope factor then you're also modeling the latent mean difference or latent mean change across time. So that's one example where mean structures are highly relevant in confirmatory factor analysis when you have longitudinal or repeated measures data. Another example is multi-group analysis. So when you make comparisons across, for example, males and females or across different countries or different cultures or other groups that are independent, kind of like what you would do in an independent samples t-test or in a one-way analysis of variance when you have independent groups and you want to compare them, then oftentimes the interest is in mean differences between the groups. For example, let's say we have a single factor model with four indicators and we have two groups and let's say maybe we have males and females and we're interested in knowing are males better in terms of their spatial abilities than females. So the factor here might represent spatial ability and then we can compare the mean for group one or males to the mean of group two or females and then so say we would find out this way whether there are differences between groups and so once again when we do that then the mean structure is relevant obviously so we need to include the means in the analysis so that we can compare those latent means now how does this work so how would you um, do this technically how can we identify latent means and that's not totally trivial so i want to show you here an example based on again the longitudinal cfa that i showed you on the first slide and so how would we be able to identify the mean of those two factors where does the information come from so let's take a look at measurement equations so in this situation where we have a variable yit where i indicates the indicator or variable and t indicates the time point then the measurement equation of a congeneric factor model includes an intercept alpha i a factor loading lambda i times the factor ft notice that f is time specific because there's a factor at each time point and an error variable epsilon it that reflects measurement error and or specific variable influences that are not shared with the other indicators of this factor. Notice that in this measurement equation, the intercepts or additive constants alpha i and the multiplicative constants or factor loadings lambda i have no index t for the time point. And that is because here we're assuming measurement equivalence or measurement invariance, specifically strong measurement equivalence, or we say scalar measurement invariance, where both the intercepts and the loadings for a given variable are time invariant or constant across time, we could say. So you can see this here in the picture. The first loading for both time points is fixed to one for identification, and that implies invariance across time for that loading because it's one at each time point. And the second loading is lambda two. So it's exactly the same loading for y21 and y22 because it's the same indicator measured at two different time points and we're assuming the loading stays the same. The intercept is not shown here in the path diagram, but it's included in the model. And so this is one aspect of the mean structure here is that we include intercepts and that we test whether intercepts and factor loadings are time invariant for measurement equivalence. That's a testable assumption that we can test with model comparisons, model fit tests. And I have separate videos and a whole playlist on this channel about measurement invariance, measurement equivalence, explaining in more detail what that means and what different levels of measurement invariance we can test and how that is done. So you can check that out as well if you're interested. Now, from this measurement equation, how do we get to the mean structure? And 
it's relatively simple. So we take the mean or expected value E here of yit and then this is equal to the mean of the constant alpha plus the mean of lambda times the factor plus the mean of our error variable epsilon it. And then this term simplifies considerably because the mean of a constant is equal to the constant. So that's alpha i and the expected value of lambda i times factor ft is equal to lambda i times the mean of the factor ft and the mean of the error variable by definition in classical test theory in a congeneric measurement model is zero. So errors average out over time and they are unsystematic so classical test theory says epsilon always has a mean of zero by definition even if we don't uh, go with classical test theory and we just go with a standard factor analytic model then most factor analytic people would also say yeah the, for the error terms we don't include a mean structure there's no mean structure so epsilon mean uh, epsilon means we don't have to worry about that simply drops from our mean structure equation now you can see that now the mean of a given variable in this model is explained by alpha and lambda times the mean of the factor. And so now in, in order to identify the mean of a factor, we can set the alpha of a reference variable to zero. So specifically here, without loss of generality, we uh, select the first variable at each time point and we fix the intercept or additive constant for y1t uh, to zero. And for the same variable, we fix the loading to one, like you can already see here in the picture. So these loadings are fixed to one. And for the same variables, the intercepts alpha uh, one are fixed to zero. Then. When you plug that into the equation for y1t, you get y1t equals mean of ft. So this shows us that the mean of the first variable at each time point identifies the latent means. And now you can say, well, this is trivial, then why should I um, deal with latent means if they are simply equal to the observed means? But it's not totally trivial because remember there's measurement invariance. So the model is restricted, meaning all the remaining intercepts and loadings are set equal across time and that implies a testable covariance and mean structure so that the means that are model implied will not be exactly equal to the observed means and so it is not a totally trivial um, derivation so to say here to show that the latent means are identified in this way and so in, in this way we can identify the mean at each time point and also in the latent difference or latent change score model we can um, with this same principle identify the mean of the latent difference score variable or latent change score variable so that we can estimate it and then we can test whether the means are significantly different across time as part of a model like this. So this shows you that mean structures can be quite useful to include in confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling, in particular when you have longitudinal data or when you have multi-group data where, you co where you're comparing multiple groups. When you have a single group and cross-sectional data, we typically don't care that much about the mean structure because in that situation, really the means of the latent variables are arbitrary and depends, depend on our way of scaling the latent variables and there's no comparison really unless you have um, a specific design where that might be of interest for some reason. But typically with cross-sectional single group data, it's not so interesting. Nonetheless, modern programs for structural equation modeling such as M plus and Lavan will by default include the mean structure even for cross-sectional single group data. And then typically what happens is that simply the intercepts of the variables are estimated, latent means are not estimated, and the intercepts are simply equal to the observed variable means because there's no restriction on the mean structure as opposed to this model here, for example, where there would be a restriction on the mean structure due to constraints of time invariant or equal intercepts across time. Now, another thing that I should mention is that 
the way that I showed you here how a mean structure can be identified in a factor model is not the only way in which this can be done. For example, in multi-group analysis, oftentimes we use a different way of identifying latent means where we estimate all intercepts, we estimate um, the loadings except for a reference variable, but we set them equal across groups and then we set the mean to zero in a reference group for the latent variables. We set all the means um, in a reference group to zero and we estimate the means in the other groups so that the means that are estimated for the latent variables in the other groups are um, examined relative to the reference group. So that can also be done and that's an equivalent way of identifying the mean structure and there are other ways also in which this can be done. I hope you found this video useful to learn more about including mean structures in CFA and SEM. Please consider subscribing to this channel and don't forget to check out the description for additional resources and I'll see you next time.